Oh, hello. Uh, my name is Castillo. I'm from the University of Maryland here in College Park. So I'd like to talk to you about uh, frame theory, especially GABO uh, frames. Uh, hopefully, by the end of the talk, I'll probably sort of uh, touch upon a little bit um, the theory of frame i just briefly mention what it is, and uh, if you have any question, I can try to answer you at the end. Uh, I just want to check that you're hearing me fine. Uh, if you can let me know, and uh, I can continue. Uh, uh, can yes. you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Good. All right, so the, the, the plan for the talk is the following. So, uh, so I'll, I'll give a brief background on Hilbert spaces, and I'll talk a little bit about our normal bases in Hilbert spaces. Uh, then I'll try to motivate uh, the introduction of Garbo system um, by some called time frequency analysis. Uh, then I'll sort of uh, get to the core part of the talk, which is uh, to talk about what's known today as Garbo system, give that definition, uh, talk about a little bit about some of the problems that you encounter when you work with this object, and uh, how you can sort of uh, resolve this problem by relaxing some sort of condition about uh, your system. Then uh, I'll give you uh, sort of a flavor of uh, what GABO is sort of useful. And uh, I'll try to finish a talk with uh, a different perspective of GABO, uh, from, of GABO analysis. And uh, that will probably lead to motivating the definition of wavelet. All right, so this is essentially the, a, a small review of uh, Hilbert space. So throughout the talk, I sort of uh, work on the separable Hilbert space. And I just want to recall that a family of function, uh, a countable family of function uh, of, that of your system. And then if you take the closure of this set, then if you get the whole space back, then you, uh, the, your Hilbert space is separable. Uh, this is equivalent to say that uh, if a vector is such that its inner product with all the uh, elements in your system is zero, then the, uh, the vector itself must be a vector. So that's what it means for a system of uh, uh, countable many vector in a Hilbert space to be complete. Now, I call the system to be an orthonormal basis if not only it's complete, but also it satisfies this orthogonality relation of the inner product between Fn and Fm is uh, the uh, delta of Mn, which is if n is equal to m, and which is uh, zero otherwise. So, one condition is just to say that the, the vector are unit norm vector, and the other condition is just to say that the vectors are orthogonal to each other. So if you have an orthonormal basis in a Hilbert space, then uh, for any function or any vector in your Hilbert space, you can write the function uh, in the following series expansion. So f is equal to uh, the sum of uh, f inner product fn, so you can view this quantity right here as somehow like the coefficient f when you decompose f into this orthonormal basis. So you decompose f into each of these directions, and then you just sort of reconstruct it with uh, the given direction. So not only you have that, but uh, the norm of your function is exactly equal to the norm of the L2 norm of a sequence of coefficient. So this is a very, very important uh, of equality uh, uh, because it sort of relate like potentially a function that sort of defined uh, to be like uh, uh, a continuous function. What I meant by that is that it's a function that sort of uh, defined on the on the real line. It completely characterizes a function in terms of a discrete set, where the set is just the set of this coefficient. So most of the time, and uh, the example that I'll use in a few minutes will illustrate this. Uh, the norm of the function in the Hilbert space can be thought of as the energy in the signal. And uh, on this side, what you're saying is that you're sort of discretizing the energy. You're sort of saying that you can look at your function completely in terms of this sequence of, uh, of number. So if you want to do sort of uh, any signal processing of uh, f, then it's most likely useful, uh, the case that you probably want to use this coefficient essentially um, for compression or for or any reconstruction or sort of any deep analysis of your signal, what you want to do is to analyze the behavior option. And the final uh, thing that I would like to mention is that 
if you have two functions in your Hilda space, then the inner product can be completely described in terms of the inner product of the corresponding sequence, F inner product Fn and G inner product uh, Fn. So this is uh, something quite uh, useful here. So I have like uh, uh, a function in general, I'll think about this function being a signal uh, about like a sound, like a telephone conversation, like an image. Then you want to understand the behavior of a function. What an orthonormal basis allows you to do is to discretize your function and sort of uh, get some coefficient on which you want to sort of do your analysis. So that is essentially the flavor of what's going to sort of uh, happen in the later in this talk. I'll try to sort of, uh, show how do you can construct specific example of uh, of orthonormal basis, and then I'll show you some limitation of this orthonormal basis, and then sort of. Uh, essentially tell you what happened, I mean, how you can sort of uh, fix those, those problems. Uh, be before I move on, I just want to sort of mention that uh, if you have an orthonormal basis and uh, if you want to know a function, all you need to know is to know all these coefficients. However, if one of them is missing, then essentially you cannot sort of get your function back exactly. And that's the problem with orthonormal basis. They are too rigid in the sense of, of one of the coefficients coming from your orthonormal basis pretty much will not allow you to reconstruct what, or not reconstruct exactly what you you, you expect it, what you're looking for. So that's one of the problem of, of, of orthonormal basis that I'll try to sort of uh, explain how to sort of uh, uh, remove. So in the talk, uh, I'll essentially be looking at uh, two, uh, two Hilbert spaces. So the first one is the space of uh, square, uh, uh, square integrable Hilbert spaces. So I'll take function that are Lebesgue measurable uh, from uh, R to the complex number, and then I'll equip that with the L2 norm. And uh, clearly this L2 norm comes from this inner product right here. And uh, this is going to be the main object of the talk today. Uh, I also want to mention that for any finite number A and B, I can look at the restriction of uh, Lebesgue measurable function to the interval A, B, and look at function that are square integrable in this interval. So in that case, I'm just going to denote it L2 of A, B. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether or not I close the interval at the two end point or if I have them like uh, half open the way I have it here. All right, so the, another tool that I'll use a lot in the talk is the notion of Fourier transform. So I'm not sure how much uh, uh, you're familiar with, uh, with this, but I just want to sort of um, give like a basic definition of Fourier transform. So if you take a function that's L1, uh, that is in the intersection of L1 and L2, then you define it to transform to be the new function F hat. You can show that this function is in fact in L2 of R. In fact, if I assume that F is in L1 also, then the Fourier transform is not only an L2 function, but you can actually prove that it's a uniformly continuous function that goes to zero at infinity. So the Fourier transform is defined for this formula, F hat of psi, is equal to the integral over the real line of f of t e to a power minus two pi i t x dt. So it's a standard tool in analysis to prove that L2 intersection L1 is dense in L2, and therefore you can potentially extend the definition of a Fourier transform just from L2 into uh, from the dense subset to the whole L2 space. Um, so in order to do that, you just have to realize that the, the Fourier transform is up an isolated tree. So it means that any function in L2, uh, you sort of restrict first to the intersection. Then the, uh, the, uh, the L2 norm of the Fourier transform is exactly the L2 norm of the function. And the inner product between uh, the Fourier transform of two functions is exactly the inner product of the Fourier transform. So in that sense, uh, the Fourier transform actually preserve not only orthogonality, because if f and g were orthogonal, then the inner product of uh, f hat and g hat will also be zero, which will mean that they are also orthogonal. And uh, it also preserves the length of every vector. So if f was a vector of unit norm, then f hat will also have unit norm exactly. So using those properties, it's easy actually or standard to define the Fourier transform on the whole L2 of R. Uh, the point being that in that case, uh, the definition is no longer pointwise, but you have to do this as sort of uh, a limit process. So it's going to be an L2 limit of uh, a sequence coming from L2. So roughly speaking, what I want to sort of point out is the following interpretation. If uh, f of t represents uh, the temporal or the spatial content of a function or a signal at time t, 
then f hat of c uh, is essentially the frequency content of that uh, function at frequency c. So in a way, f, f of t and f, f hat of c sort of represent exactly the same object, but in different domains. This you view it as your function in time, and this you view it as your function in frequency. And uh, using this property right here, what you have is that uh, the information that you have in time is completely preserved in frequency and vice versa. From that point of view, uh, going from frequency to, to, to time is a reversible process. I can sort of give you the function in time or give you in Fourier transform domain, and you can go back and forth between the two. I did sort of have like the formula here for the inversion formula. But, uh, it's sort of something straightforward. Instead of having like the minus on the exponential here, you have a plus, and you can prove that these two uh, will sort of be inverse of each other. But we will not need any of those sort of uh, notion today. All I just want to sort of mention is that sometime I'm just going to sort of think about your function being uh, being defined in time when I don't have a Fourier transform. And when I have a Fourier transform, it's going to essentially represent the same function, but just in frequency. So are we doing all right so far? Any questions? Uh, hmm. uh, I think uh, I think they said no. No, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. So just stop me and then uh, stop and go back to any detail if you want. All right, so this is uh, essentially the starting point of what's known today as time frequency analysis. So uh, let g of t be the Gaussian function. So g of t is e to the power minus pi t squared. In 1932, uh, von, uh, von Neumann claimed without proof that the following family of functions, so I denoted by g, and then there is a one parameter, which is a function g, that's here. Uh, and two parameters right here, they are just said to be one, one. I'll sort of change it in a little bit. But uh, this family consists of the following. They are functions that are indexed by two parameters, n and k. And n and k come from the integer, positive and negative integer. And this family is defined for this formula. So I take my function, I'll sort of shift it by n. And then I'm going to multiply it by this uh, frequency of this pure frequency function, e to the power 2 pi kt. And k and n belong to z. So the claim that John uh, von Neumann made was that this family of function is complete in L2 of r, which part every function is completely determined essentially by uh, 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 some sort of expansion into this family. In other words, if I give you a function whose inner product with all this guy was zero, then the function has to essentially be the zero function. So he did not give any sort of uh, proof to this claim. And uh, a few years later, Denis Garbo, uh, who later won the Nobel Prize, uh, claimed actually without any proof that uh, any function in L2 can be written in this, uh, uh, in this form. So the function f can be written as uh, the infinite series, uh, minus uh, n going from minus infinity to infinity, k going from minus infinity to infinity of some complex coefficient exponential of 2 to a power uh, e to the power 2 pi i k t and then g translated by uh, by n. So I want you to sort of uh, see the similarity of this with something that you're probably familiar with, which is uh, the notion of Fourier sets. Uh, if this sum right here was not there, and if this function was not there, then what you have exactly is essentially a Fourier expansion of your function f. I mean, you have to sort of be a little bit careful. Your function cannot be in L2 of R. But what John, uh, what Gabo was actually actually saying that, it's saying that if your function is not completely like a periodic function, you can use this function g to sort of almost make it periodic, expand it in Fourier series on around the function g, and just piece it together in order to get f. But Gabo did not sort of give any proof to his claim, and uh, I want you to sort of also notice the similarity between the claim. Uh, Gabo's uh, claim is actually a lot stronger. He's not only saying that this is actually complete, but he's also actually saying that you can expand it in this fashion, that you could find coefficient CNK for which this equality is going to hold. What von Neumann claim is slightly weaker. It's just sort of saying that uh, the fact of this function, if you look at the uh, finite uh, uh, linear combination, they form a complete system. In other words, the closure of that set is going to be all the L2 of R. But the two are completely related, and that's what I will try, I will try to sort of uh, 
show in a few minutes. Uh, before I move forward, I just want to sort of uh, make the following observation. Uh, if dt is equal to e to the power minus pi t squared, it's not difficult to sort of uh, compute the Fourier transform of this. This is exactly the same function. So I want you to sort of observe the function here and to observe, to look at it, Fourier transform, they are exactly the same function. So the Gaussian is of the Fourier transform of it. And therefore, I want you to sort of look at uh, this building block of this elementary function, y right here, g of n k t. Uh, they are essentially exponential of 2 pi n g of t minus k. So if you sort of agree with me that the Gaussian, uh, I'll just sort of draw a small picture of Gaussian here. So this function is essentially sort of, uh, so this is g of t. Uh, equal to e to the power minus pi t squared, this function is essentially localized in time uh, around zero, meaning that most of the activity of this function occur in the neighborhood of the origin. But the Fourier transform has exactly the same shape. So the Fourier transform is treated around like uh, the origin. So what this function is doing, the function g of n k of t, it's that it's sort of shifting the, uh, the region in which the function is uh, quote and quote active to uh, the to the point k on the x axis and the point n on the y axis essentially so this function is localized that's what i'm going to say is localized at k f the time frequency plane i think of about the time frequency plane as being the, uh, the plane that sort of uh, has in one direction time and in the second direction it has like the frequency information and uh I want to sort of keep this sort of uh, in mind when I sort of uh, look at the physical interpretation of uh, this series mention. What he's saying is saying that if you give me any function, I can sort of uh, find like a, a self coefficient so that the function can be expanded into time frequency shift of a given function. If are going to sort of be essentially localized at k and n. And this is something that I'm going to come back to later, but I just want to sort of put it uh, out here right now so that you sort of uh, see the intuition that's somehow behind what I'm about to, to go over. So to sort of uh, get a feeling of uh, what I just talked about, uh, I just want to sort of uh, review very quickly the notion of Fourier series. So for any uh, integer, negative or positive, let E n of t denote the function e to the power 2 pi i n t. E n is a one periodic function and clearly uh, it equal to L2 of 0, 1. Uh, it's easy or straightforward actually to prove that E n, inner product E n, is uh, exactly delta of n m. In other words, if n is equal to m, this is equal to 1. So what this means is just that this is equal to. one and n is equal to m and zero h. Okay, so this thing are clearly orthonormal and uh, you can actually prove that they are complete, that if you have like a, so if you have like an L2 function whose inner product with every single of the EN is zero, then the function must be zero almost everywhere. And uh, putting those two facts together, you get that this system is in fact an orthonormal basis for L2 of zero one. And uh, any function in L2 of zero one has the following Fourier, uh, Fourier series expansion. So, you can write f as the summation n for minus infinity to infinity, f inner product with e n, and reconstruct exactly with the e n. And uh, what I sort of show on this slide is slightly the same thing, except that the coefficient now also depend on the location on which you are sort of working at, and that's what I'll try to explain later on. So this is essentially the, the, the basis of Fourier series. And uh, what I would like to do is uh, to look at this from another point of view. So uh, if you call g of t to be the characteristic function of the interval 0, 1, 
then it's clear that if I look at the system exponential of 2 pi i n t g of t and n in the integer, this is an orthonormal basis of L2 of 0, 1. Notice that I did not do anything. I mean, because this function g of t on this end level is exactly 1. So what this statement is, is nothing but what I already just sort of wrote as uh, the consequence here. So I haven't done anything new here. I'm just sort of introducing this function. And you're going to sort of see in a minute what uh, this uh, function will allow to do. So I would like to sort of shift this whole system. Uh, can you give me just a minute, please? Sorry, somebody at my door, okay? All right, so what I want you to observe is the following. Uh, I want to shift this function, this whole sequence by, uh, this whole uh, sequence of function by an integer k. Now, if I shift this exponential by k, nothing will happen because all I'm doing is sort of doing like e to a power two pi i and t minus k. And if you multiply it for you use the fact that of the exponential at uh, integer frequency gives you exactly one, you'll obtain this, this guy again. However, what's going to change is that this function is going to be shifted now and is going to become the characteristic function of the interval from k to k plus one. And that's exactly what I wrote down here. So by shifting this whole thing to k, I'm going to have a new family of function and that's by k. I fix k here and I look at this new system, it's going to be exponential of 2 pi i n t, g of t minus uh, k, and n goes for minus infinity, infinity again. Now, I haven't done anything. All I've done is sort of shift the support of a function. So since this family was an orthonormal basis of L2 of 0, 1, this new family will be an orthonormal basis of L2 of uh, the interval k to k plus 1. So you can check this easily, uh, that if you fix k, if you look at any n and m, then this inner product will be exactly the same as the inner product of two of this guy, and will be one if n is equal to m, and it will be zero if not. Uh, you can also sort of prove that this family is also going to be complete, L2 of, uh, k, of uh, k plus one, and uh, the conclusion will be that uh, this system will be exactly an orthonormal basis. So now, I want you to sort of uh, see what I like to, you can sort of try to uh, you probably sort of uh, notice what's going on here. So I start at zero. This is zero. I go to one. I go to two. I go to three. I go to four. I go backward to negative one. Negative two. Negative three. And I continue. Now, on L2 of 0, it's exactly equal to 0, 1. This k was exactly equal to 0, 1. I have an orthonormal basis based uh, here. When k is equal to 1, I have a new orthonormal basis here. When k is equal to 2, I'll have another orthonormal basis here, and so forth. I want you to notice that the orthonormal basis that's sort of sitting here is completely different from the one that's sort of sitting here, completely different of the one that's sort of here. So if I piece them all together, I can also see that I have actually an orthonormal basis of L2 of R because each of these pieces is an orthonormal basis. It's going to be orthogonal to every other piece. And so the uh, orthogonal uh, addition of this thing will give me an orthonormal basis of L2 of uh, R. And that's what I'm about to sort of check uh, in this last uh, line here. So if K is not equal to K prime, uh, each vector in this system is orthogonal to any vector in the system corresponding to k prime. And the proof is straightforward. Uh, uh, it's exactly due to the fact that when k is not equal to k prime, this function right here and this function right here live on two different intervals. And therefore, this function, this product is actually zero before you take any integral. So if you, not, you, you notice that, then now what you sort of uh, to also notice is that if I now take the whole family of G and K of T, letting N and K from minus infinity to infinity, I can prove that this family is complete in the sense that if a vector F or a function F in L2 of R is particular to all of this guy, then 
it has to be the zero vector. So the way you see it is that fix k first and look at this inner product. This is going to be zero. So it just tells you that f when you restrict it to the interval k to k plus one is zero. But since this is true for all the restriction of f, then it means that f is zero. Here I'm sort of uh, making an abuse of language. Uh, zero here means uh, almost everywhere. So with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So this function is going to be uh, zero almost everywhere. So you identify that function with a zero function. And what you've shown is that uh, uh, this new system is a complete uh, set of vector in L2 of uh, R. And since you've proved already that this family of function uh, is an orthonormal basis, uh, is an orthonormal set, then your conclusion is that you have like an orthonormal basis for L2 of R. So I want you to sort of see the similarity between this statement right here, that this is uh, an orthonormal basis of L2 of R, and uh, the claim that John, uh, von Neumann and Gabo made. So what they sort of claim is that, uh, I'm trying to go back here to what they claim, is that if I have G, which is a Gaussian, and uh, I shift it by N and uh, exponentiate it by uh, frequency at K, where K are integer, then this is a complete system. And what Gabo is actually, uh, any function can be written as a, uh, uh, as a, an expansion, an infinite expansion in terms of this function right here. And what there. I've sort of uh, arrived at at uh, this point here is that the statement that we made is true, but for a different G, not the G that we had in mind, but the G that the characteristic function of the interval zero, one. Now, what's, what sort of going on here? Uh, G, which is a characteristic function of the interval zero to one, is not a continuous function, uh, and it has jump discontinuity at, uh, at, uh, at uh, the origin and at one. And if you're trying to sort of approximate a function in L2 it's continuous with this guy, this is probably a silly thing to do. You're trying to approximate something nice by something bad, and that's not something you like to do. On the other hand, the function that uh, von Neumann and uh, Gabo had in mind, this is probably the sort of uh, best function you can think of. This function goes to zero faster than any exponential, is infinitely really differentiable, and this is a function in the Shor's class. So what they're trying to do is actually uh, something that they are uh, in their mind, especially this expression, uh, expression by Gabo, in his mind this will be useful since if you can sort of compute somehow algorithmically the risk coefficient, the fact that this function decay very fast will allow you to sort of make an approximation to f with very, very few friction. However, if you use g to be the characteristic function of the interval 0, 1, you most likely have to sort of use a lot of this guy in order to get your approximation. So what sort of the difference between these two functions, and why is one of them, and why is the one that Gabo and uh, von Neumann consider still sort of uh, not completely uh, um, characterized? And uh, the answer to the question lies uh, in the following definition. So we're going to make a definition now. So let G be an L2 function, and uh, choose two numbers. Then the collection of functions uh, that depend on G. So I want you to sort of see this family depend on three things. Uh, it depends first on the function G right here. It depends on two positive parameters, A and B. And uh, it's defined to be the collection of all functions that you obtain by taking G and translating it by multiple of A. So K multiplied by A and uh, by multiplying by this exponential when you the, the frequency are multiple of B. So in most in the two examples that I looked at earlier, G was either the, uh, the Gaussian or the indicator function of zero one, and A and B were chosen to be equal to one. So this is an example of this is what's called a Gabo or Y Heisenberg system with generator G. Sometimes you call G the generator, sometimes you also call it the window function, and A and B are the parameters. So here A is thought of as being a parameter and B is thought of as being the frequency parameter. So when I said something is a Gabo system, what I meant is that I'm given a G, which is an L2 function, and two positive numbers, and I form this collection of vector. This is a complete collection of vector, and this is an example or sort of a generalization of what Gabo and von Neumann consider, and what I just sort of show you using G to be the characteristic function of an interval. So uh, the first thing to notice is that uh, we've already encountered some of these guys. So the characteristic function 
and a and b equal to one then this family is a GABO system we call it the GABO, a GABO orthonormal basis for ultra so the bad news for for the system that uh, that GABO and von Neumann had in mind is the following theorem and uh, the theorem says the following uh, if this family of function we, where G is in L1, or oh, sorry, L2, and you choose A and B to be equal to, I'll show in a minute that this restriction is not a big deal. What's important is the product between A and B that's important. The product has to be one. So if such a family is an orthonormal basis, then the product of this quantity should be infinity. Here, I'm trying to recall the definition of Fourier transform, and I want you to sort of uh, look at uh, this quantity right here. And if you notice it, if you remember anything about the Heisenberg inequality, it's that this guy is exactly the product uh, in the Heisenberg inequality. And uh, what's known is that this is always bounded below. This is always bounded below by a constant C, where the constant C is independent of uh, the function G and, uh, and uh, independent of the function G. So what the theorem says is the following. You give me any GABO orthonormal basis if A is equal to 1 and B is equal to 1, then this product has to be equal to infinity. So right to it rules out the Gaussian because of the Gaussian. In fact, we know that the Gaussian is a function that achieves the inequality in the uncertainty principle. In particular, if I use a Gaussian, this quantity is going to be finite. So what GABO and uh, von Neumann were to do at least what Gabo was hoping to do cannot be possible. You can never expand a function in terms of time frequency shift of a Gaussian where you use a shift by one or multiple of one in time and multiple of one in frequency, since this prevents you of using the Gaussian function. So that I sort of uh, uh, sorry, try to say here. So at least this says is that Gabo claim is not true. At least the convergence of a series that we had in mind cannot be an L2 convergence. Let me go back to the convergence and then sort of show you what's going on. Uh, this is what he claimed, that you should be always able to have this. So if it was an orthonormal basis, then what the Balian law theorem says, it says that, uh, the product of these two numbers should be equal to infinity. But for the Gaussian, because g of t is e to the power minus pi t squared, this is integrable. And uh, since for the Gaussian, so it itself, in fact, this quantity is just the square of that guy. And you can show that this is actually what achieves that in the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So uh, from this point of view, uh, uh, the Gabo claim cannot sort of hold in L2. And in fact, it's been shown that the convergence series is not even sort of true in uh, in the sense of the Schwarz, uh, Schwarz distribution or tempered distribution. So his claim was completely, completely wrong. And uh, but it sort of gives it an insight on what he wanted to do. Uh, I just want to point out that theorem was first proved in uh, ninety one by uh, a physicist called Balian, and uh, reproved later by another physicist called Leo. Uh, both of them have some sort of technical problem that were later faced by mathematicians, including Kortman and Dobeshi. Uh, and uh, this has a long story in, uh, in, in the time frequency analysis community. So a general version of the theorem says the following. If A and B are two positive numbers whose product is one, and if this is an orthonormal basis, then this product should be, again, infinity. So there was nothing very specific about A equal to 1 or A equal to 1. What's important is that the product of A and B is exactly equal to 1. Whenever I have an orthonormal basis in that case, then this product should be infinity. And this is, uh, this is essentially bad news because this somehow measures the concentration of your function in time and frequency. If this thing was finite, it would tell you that your function um, because this quantity by the Fourier, the, uh, the relationship between Fourier transform and derivative is nothing but the L2 norm of the derivative of G. Saying essentially, if this was uh, this was finite, you'll know that your function and the Fourier transform belong, and the derivative of your function belong to L2. 
which somehow show that your function is actually like a wise in time and frequency. Your function is not too bad. But having this effect right here rule out uh, the fact that for gal or phenomenal basis, you can never accept to expect to have like a function that are well localized in time frequency. And that's what I try to sort of say here. It's not completely like a rigorous statement. And uh, but uh, what this says loosely is that uh, all GABO or phenomenal basis are poorly localized in time frequency plane. Uh, and uh, the example that I want to sort of point uh, point to is uh, when you have characteristic function of interval zero one, then this is perfectly localized in in time because it's a compact it's a compactly supported function. However, this function decay poorly in frequency. The Fourier transform of this function is a function that we usually call the sync function given by this expression right here. So you see that if you sort of uh, take this and plug it into this equation, then psi square will just cancel each other and then you have the integral of sine square. And that integral is not well defined. And so this quantity is clearly infinity. And, uh, uh, and that's sort of a problem with uh, double orthonormal basis. You can achieve an orthonormal basis but at the expense of sort of using functions that are poorly localized, and those are functions that will not allow you to do any numerical work. So in order to sort of uh, solve this problem, uh, a different notion, or uh, a little bit more uh, more relaxed one, the notion of orthogonal basis, has been introduced uh, in mathematics. I think this was introduced in 1952. Dustin and uh, Schaeffer, and uh, they made the following definition. If H is a separable Hilbert space, and if FK is uh, uh, the family FK, K from zero to infinity is a frame, if I can find two numbers, A and B, positive and less than infinity, they can be equal to each other, so that for any vector or any function in my Hilbert space, I have A, the norm of F square, is uh, almost equal to the sum of the square of the inner product of f and fk, and is less or equal to b multiplied by the norm of f squared. So I want you to sort of uh, remember uh, the statement at the beginning about orthonormal basis, and uh, right uh, here, that if I have an orthonormal basis, the L2 norm is exactly equal to the little L2 norm in the product, or uh, in the inner product of f with the uh, each of the frame vectors, or each of the vector in your basis. But what I'm sort of uh, claiming here now is some, something slightly weaker. So in particular, orthonormal basis achieve this equation, this inequality with A equal to B equal to one. But here I have something a little bit more relaxed. I just want to sort of say that the norm of F square is equivalent to this norm. That's all I'm sort of saying. And the number A and B are usually referred as uh, the, the lower frame bound and the upper, upper frame bound. Again, I want to point out that B and A are not unique. If I have any B, then two multiplied by B will be another good candidate. So most of it frame bound of the, the least lower frame bound and the, uh, the greatest or low, uh, lower frame bound will be the best one, optimal one in a way. Okay, but here I'm not going to try to sort of make any sort of statement about that. Uh, once I can find the number B and the number A for which it is true, no matter which F I use, I'll sort of claim that I have a frame. So I'm not going to worry about what's the optimal A and what's the optimal B. So if I sort of specialize this definition to the GABO system that I defined earlier, then what I have to follow, let G be an L2 function and let A and B be positive. So this system of vector or, or function, uh, again, I'm taking my G, I'm shifting it in time by multiple of B, and I'm multiplying in frequency by multiple of, uh, uh, of A. Then I'm going to start this family is a frame for L2 of R. If I can find two number A and B for which I have a, a previous inequality hole, the only thing is that my family is now indexed by two uh, integers, so I have to take a double sum. So that's the only sort of a difference between this and the previous definition. So this is what I, I want to work with uh, right now. Again, if this was an orthonormal basis, then this will hold with A equal to B equal to 1. In this case, in general, what I'm going to say, I'm going to say that this system is a garbo frame. Uh, G will be the generator, and A and B will be the parameters. 
So this is a theorem that essentially classifies all the GABO systems. So if I have a GABO system, then it's going to be an orthogonal basis or a risk basis. So uh, a risk basis is nothing but the image of an orthogonal basis under uh, an invertible transformation. So uh, if you sort of don't know that notion, it's not important for the remaining of the talk, so you don't have to worry about this notion. But all it is is just the image of an orthogonal basis under uh, an invertible map. So if it's an orthogonal basis, then A and B has to be equal to 1. And if A and B is equal to 1 and this was a frame, then it has to be an orthonormal basis. That's how you should read this statement that I made here. So in other words, orthonormal basis can only occur when the product of A and B is equal to In this case, as we've seen before, the value of theorem says that the product of these two quantities should be infinity. And this is bad because the function that you can use are somehow like just function that behave like uh, the characteristic of the intervals. So, uh, so this is somehow a limiting case. What happens when the product of A and B is larger than 1? Then this will never be a frame. So in other words, when A and B, if the product of A and B is bigger than 1, this inequality will never hold. In fact, you can prove that when A and B is bigger than 1, you can have plenty of vector G that give you something that's not even complete. Uh, and then if A and B is less than 1, then there is this well-localized GABO frame. In other words, when the product of A and B is less than 1, I can find very nice function G for which this system will satisfy this frame inequality right here. And so this is the regime in which we're going to be working. What happens when A and B of the product of A and B is less than 1? So the first example that I want to point it to is the following. So let's G of T be the function that the maximum of 1 minus absolute value of T and 0. So this function essentially looks like, uh, like this. So one is here, negative one is here. So it's just uh, the function, just like uh, a hat, uh, sorry, something like that, and then zero everywhere else. So this function is already continuous. Uh, in fact, it's differentiable almost everywhere except at this, uh, this endpoint. And what you can actually, and also at the origin, and then can prove is that uh, uh, the system consisting of G as generator the time parameter equal to 1 and the frequency parameter is equal to 1 half, you can prove that this is actually a GABO frame for L2 of R. Uh, this is not too difficult to prove. It involves a lot of computation, but uh, this is uh, a short statement. Next, what happened for the Gaussian? Uh, it can be proven that uh, this is a, Gauss a GABO frame if and only if the product of A and B is less than 1. So what uh, GABO was actually trying to do is actually true except he has to, he cannot take the product of A to be equal to one, he has to take the product of A, B, or he has to choose two numbers A and B so that the product is less than one and translate in M by multiple of A and in frequency by multiple of B. Whenever he does that, then he will be able to expand any function in L2 of R as a series expansion as he wrote down. Uh, uh, also in general, when uh, uh, there is this many functions that are continuous, that are uh, such that the Fourier transform along with the function are in the intersection of L2 and L1, and such that for any A, uh, for A and B less than 1, this system is a GABO frame. So the key question now is for the system, given G, given A and B, can you tell me whether or not I have a GABO frame? And here I give you a complete characterization. If I use a Gaussian, it's going to be a GABO frame if and only the product of A and B is less than 1. In general, this problem to characterize all the window that give you and all the A and B that give you a GABO frame is a completely open problem. Uh, in fact, if G is a characteristic function of an interval, this is also quite open. It's only been just recently, in fact, a few months ago. So this is somehow like um, a research area that some people are looking into right now, trying to characterize all the function G and all the parameter A and B for which this system is a, is a, is a GABO frame only very few functions have sort of been characterized so far. And Gaussian being one of them, and recently the characteristic function of an interval, and maybe two other functions that I don't have from the top of my head right now. So uh, I said this answer the other question, but I did not tell you anything, because all I show, I've shown you is uh, an inequality that's sort of satisfied by the, the frame coefficient, I mean, or 
F in a code of this GMN. How do I go from here to the expansion that Gabo was trying to achieve? And in order to understand what's going on, we have to sort of introduce uh, a few technology. So given G, uh, given this family of function, G is of a window, A and B are the parameter. Uh, we define the following operator, SG, it depends on G. In fact, it depends on A and B as well, but I'm going to assume that I fix A and B. Uh, this operator acting on the function F just does the following. It takes the inner product of F with GMN and reconstruct them with GMN. It's almost like you have your Fourier series. Think about this guy being your Fourier uh, coefficient and reconstructing them with exponential. The only problem here is that I'm allowing my Fourier coefficient to depend on the location of the function G, and that's what this is going to do. So if if uh, I own Q frequency here, then I will not have this last summation over here, but the last summation give me some, uh, some information about the location in space at which my function here is, uh, is located. So you can actually show that uh, the fact that the system is a Gabo frame is exactly equivalent to the fact that the inner product SG and F is between B multiplied by F square and A multiplied by F square. Uh, this is difficult to see because uh, if you don't worry about any convergence issues, then if you look at the inner product of this guy with F, then all you're doing, you're sort of taking the F here and integrating. And, um, you, you could easily sort of justify why that will lead you to sort of get that uh, this is exactly equal to B square. But this quantity is exactly in the definition of a, uh, of, uh, of a frame, right? Because to have a frame, I should sort of have this expression right here. And this is nothing but S of ST of F in a product with F. So from there, what you get is that uh, since this is the case, then uh, you can sort of see that SG should be a positive definite operator. So the smallest eigenvalue of this, uh, this operator is totally positive, and uh, that will imply that the operator is invertible as an operator on L2. And therefore, if you give me any L2 function, then I can easily write F as SG multiplied inverse of S applied to F, because these two get me exactly the identity. But if you look at the definition of SG of anything, it's just the inner product of uh, that function with the GMN, and then I reconstruct with the GMN. Now, because S is a positive definite operator, its inverse is a positive definite. So I can use that to sort of move this guy to this side, and that's what I did here. Because it's positive definite, it also uh, self-adjoint, and therefore I don't have to worry about the adjoint of this operator right here. And so you have like uh, the sum of this guy, and this is exactly a candidate for possible coefficient that you can use to reconstruct uh, your, your, your function. And that's exactly what Gabo was trying to do. He was trying to sort of find a way to reconstruct this using this guy as, uh, as, uh, as a building block. And, and he claimed that there were some weights, he called them CN, M, and uh, here I gave you an exact formula for, for how to compute these guys. In fact, it turns out that this is actually very, very easy to compute. It's not difficult to see that S minus one G of GMN is nothing but S minus one of G apply, uh, translated by M and N in frequency. I want you to sort of see this is, this look a little bit subtle, but what it's sort of saying is that in principle, in order to get this guy, you have to compute S minus one of G M N for each of for each M and each N. But what this is saying is saying that you only have to do it once. You only have to compute S minus one of G, and then you just have to translate it and shift it by M and N respectively. And this is quite efficient for computation. And so I decide to write this new system as G tilde M N and my function G tilde is nothing but S minus one G of G. This is an L2 function because S of G was inverted L2, and therefore this defines an element in L2. Uh, so you can sort of, we can summarize this by uh, saying, uh, I think I went too far, sorry. So we can summarize this in the following theorem. So let G of G A B be a frame for L2, A and B. So this is the lower bound, and this is the upper bound. Then there exists a new function in 
H2O of R that I call G-Tilda, such that the new system G-Tilda of A is also a garbo frame for L2. This is a big statement that I just made there. It's also a garbo frame with bound 1 over B, 1 over A. And this garbo uh, frame is called the current call dual to my original frame, such that any frame in L2 have a following series expansion. So I can write F as an inner product with the duals and I reconstruct with uh, GMN as my building block. I could do it this the other way that F can be reconstructed as the inner product with the GMN and you using you use the building block as a G tilde MN. So this flow from the flat data S minus one multiplied by S is the same as is the same as S S minus one. Sorry. And this is equal to the identity. So I use this part to prove this, but if you believe that this is also a double frame, then you can reverse the process and uh, prove that uh, this equal to the identity give you this expansion. So this is a, a formal proof of the Gabo was trying to do, except that I know now that I cannot use a Gaussian as my window. If I have to use a Gaussian, then I have to use A multiplied by B to be less than one. If A and B was equal to one or the product is equal to one, then I can only use bad function like the characteristic function of intervals. So what I would like to do is to sort of put all this in sort of uh, a broader perspective. So in order to do that, I would like to introduce like uh, two operators. So for any number C and D, a real number, and any function G in L2 of R, I like to define an operation that corresponds to shifting by C. So all I'm doing to my function is I'm shifting shifting my function to uh, by C. And uh, the other operator that I would like to introduce is MD. And that operator, what it will do, it will just sort of multiply by your function by a few frequency where the frequency is exactly at D. So if you use this notation, then the building block for your GABO system will function GMN of T, which were shift by MA in time and in the frequency by N, B, is nothing but the composition of these two guys, T, M, A, and M, N, B. So each of these elements in my GABO system is nothing but a uh, frequency shift of a generator. So I have a fixed window function G, and then I just sort of shift it in the frequency plane by the, uh, by the quantity MA and NB. So what this is, uh, this inner product of F multiplied by GMN, which is exactly uh, one of the things that appear in this expansion right here, is nothing but uh, uh, a measure of a time frequency content of my function around position MA and NB in the time frequency plane. So around time MA and around frequency NB, this can measure how much and for I have essentially. And that was actually the origin of Garbo uh, uh, idea. He wanted something that's going to measure not only pure frequency information or pure temporal information, but something that can combine the two together and this is exactly what so this object are sort of uh, doing. So there is a lot more I can sort of talk about as far as GABO system is concerned, but I would like to sort of stop here because I just want to give you a flavor of what's sort of going on. Uh, I could sort of, uh, we could probably try to sort of schedule something later on where I can sort of go more into some detail. But I want to sort of point out uh, the fundamental role played by two objects here, the translation and the modulation operator, so TMA and MNB. So what happens if I sort of change this operator, one of these operators in particular, what happens if I sort of uh, don't look at uh, the modulation, but replace it with uh, a new operator? So this new operator is what I'm going to call the dilation operator. So what it will do, it will just sort of scale my function. And I'm sort of using this scale factor here so that it preserves the L2 norm of the function. So what this function will do, it will just sort of compress or sort of uh, expand the function and just sort of uh, scale the height of the function. So if I look at the family uh, of function, 
where I scale by two to the power j, where j is any integer, and I translate by two to the power j by k, t is still the translation operator, and then phi or psi is a given function. If I look at this family, usually uh, we call this type of family uh, an affine system in uh, L2 of R. So if you can choose psi in L2 of R so that this family form an orthonormal basis, you call this new system an a wavelet orthonormal basis. So a wavelet sort of be thought of as the same thing as what I just said, and this is a big uh, abuse of, uh, of language. But the, the, the fundamental difference between the two is that instead of using like a time and frequency shift, I'm using time and dilation, time and dilation or time and scale. So time and scale analysis is what sort of important in the theory, while in the theory of Gabo system, what's important is time and frequency. So the classical example of wavelet or the most trivial example of wavelet is the following function, which is a function psi, which is one from zero to one half, negative one from one half to one and zero everywhere else. So using this function, you can actually prove that this family is a normal basis for L2 of R, and that this is usually called the high wavelet. Again, this is just sort of designed to give you a flavor of what you can do when you sort of change your system. You can view all these things from a group theoretical point of view where you're looking at translation and dilation of this translation and modulation operators. So I would like to stop or uh, sort of finish the talk here. Uh, probably try to maybe schedule something else where I can sort of uh, focus exclusively, uh, exclusively on wavelet. And uh, what I would like to do is to sort of uh, point out to a few references. Uh, this is exact uh, Gabo original paper. It's uh, in the Journal of um, Electrical Engineering. Uh, it was published in 1946. Uh, this is a typo here, right here. And if you want to learn a little bit more about the Gabo analysis, there are two books that have been edited in the last 10 years or, and by Feicheng and Stromer. Uh, this one is sort of a foundation, and this one is sort of a, a follow-up version where a little bit more advanced topic have sort of been uh, looked at. And uh, a very nice book to look at uh, time frequency analysis uh, from this point of view is a very nice book by Carl and Skoshning, uh, published in 2001. It's called Foundation of Time Frequency Analysis. And it has a lot more detail about uh, what you can do with Garbo system, what you can do with frame in general. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, I still have a few minutes. I can answer you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Investor Gunner, do you have any questions? Or? Hello? Yeah, so do you have any? In I did not hear the question. So uh, I had the one question by curiosity uh, concerning the von Neumann uh, assertion. Yes. You have, yes. Uh, so you, you say that uh, J Gaussian function one one. It's not a Gabor frame, right? It's not? A, a Gabor frame. You said that? It's not a Gabor frame. Yes, it's not a Gabor frame. So my question is, uh, could it be uh, complete? Uh, yes, actually, I did not answer that question. The answer is yes, it's complete. Okay. And then the uh, last question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, J is uh, J is the Gaussian function, so J uh, AB is the gamma even though it is less than one, right? Yes, that's correct. So that's a complete classification. So you say the function J such that uh, can, uh, 
you mean that there was uh, there were functions which were in L2 as well as the um, Fourier transform, and such that AB was in such a one, because AB was or was not in the other way. Uh, okay, what I meant here is uh, that uh, I think this is what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I meant here is that there is this function that have this property and AB, there is AB. This is not true for every AB. So okay, uh, okay, AB is not a job of right? Yes, exactly. You could, you could find G that has this property and a b less than one for which this is not a garbo frame so what i'm only claiming here is that there is this g with this property and there is this and b less than one for which this is a garbo frame and in fact this and in fact this this guy right here is an example of such a function Okay. So is there is there any kind of functional relationship between the constants A and B and those continuous functions for which uh, we have a GABO frame? Uh, yes, there have been like uh, some investigation. Some people have sort of studied the topology of a set A and B for which... Um, uh, uh, so they, 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 they put a topology on the set G and A, B for which you have a GABO system and they try to understand what type of topology uh, you have. Uh, the most recent work on this is when they look at, uh, uh, sorry, they look at the TST function okay. of uh, an interval, let's call it zero, mm -hmm. to see and then they try to sort of, uh, oh, sorry. And they try to find for which A and B and C do I have a double frame. Okay. And uh, in um, in the last two or three months, somebody has sort of solved this problem. It's been open for for probably ten years. Somebody has like completely for which A, B, and C this system is a double system. Is a double frame. Sorry. Okay. Interesting. But uh, there are very few functions for which you could do completely what I just said or said. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So are there any, any, I know you, you probably run out of time, but are there any connections to, to say, to generalize this? Because here we're looking at, uh, at uh, basically how to functions on R, right? Are there generalizations to, yes. to most, to like manifold where, let's say you have a mesh on a manifold and you have a generalizations of this to, uh, to that? Definitely. I mean, first of all, uh, all I, all I just talked about right now, you could do it on uh, on RD. Okay. Um, on on manifold, I think you'll have to sort of be a little bit careful, but it's possible when you look at uh, the the framework. Yeah. From uh, the, the point of view that I mentioned at the at the end of the talk, using the translation operator, yeah. it's possible to sort of generalize this to many setup. Like uh, you could look at this like, um, on the unit sphere in any dimension, essentially, yeah. and uh, and uh, there are other sort of type of groups where you can sort of actually look at this object from. Uh, so you have a group. Uh, if you can sort of uh, have some sort of representation of your group, then uh, it's possible to look at all these things completely in that setup. Okay. So there is nothing very specific about the, the, the real line yeah. and the Lubeck measure here. Yeah. Yeah, because I was thinking of Lee group or of a Lee group generalizing generalizing this to a Lee group. That's why I was asking that question. But I think some people have been looking at those type of question. Okay. Uh, there is a theory called co-orbit theory, yeah. and essentially it's uh, it's a statement about uh, this uh, this this type of object. Okay. 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 So any more questions uh, for for Castle or, or uh, University of Ghana? Do you have any more questions? Okay then. So thank you very much for attending to this talk, and Castle, it's, it's, it's over to you now. I guess to yeah, to finish up. So okay, thank you.
thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, again, if you have like a time in the near future, I could talk a little bit more about Wavelet and uh, maybe go more in detail about like uh, Gabo systems. Yeah, that would be that that would be actually nice. We'll try to arrange that sometime. It's yeah, very soon that when you have time and, and when the department is yeah also also has time. So we will definitely do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Thank you very much for listening. Okay to me. then. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.